thanks for joining us, everyone. Uh, we're happy to be on a Fireside Chat um, uh, 5, Episode 5 on Addressing Hunger and Malnutrition During the Pandemic. We know it's growing from the SWS uh, results. The survey is over 30% now. And we'd like to em emphasize our uh, true uh, food value chains. And uh, joining us today is, is a very um, well um, important team that's entrenched. That's entrenched in uh, you know food, food projects. And I'd like um, to um, uh, thank uh, Father Ben for taking time to be with us again. Uh, Mercy Abad of uh, Ashi uh, Ahon Shahira Foundation. And we'd like to um, um, remind us that um, they were our plenary speakers in uh, this uh, session on outreach to Philippine uh, regions in 48 pounds. We're also joined today by uh, Glenn Gregorio, who, as we know, is a Sharta director based in Filipinos Banos. And uh, he can tell us uh, his uh, take on uh, the problem overall. And he also has um, information on the DA programs. Then we have our two uh, chemists, biochemists, Yasuinho of UPD Chemistry, our metabolomics expert who's working uh, with uh, Anne uh, Lilobos and uh, Victor Amoroso. Uh, on uh, analysis of uh, ferns, but she's doing it for many other natural uh, uh, products, um, okay, plant natural products. We have Gladys Completo of Eupilus Banos, chemistry, biochemistry, <coughs> working on uh, uh, plant, uh, plant based projects to look for anti cancer compounds with Carlito Librilla. And uh, is also uh, working with me and Father Ben to try to come up with a Moringa program together with uh, UPLB uh, food scientists uh, and uh, Institute of uh, Plant Bio Plant Breeding scientists. I'd like to thank uh, Andrea Lobos for organizing this chat uh, with me. Uh, my co-moderator Anne uh, is our champion on our social amelioration project. She is our committee chair. And she leads in this project on uh, developing firms, firms as a food, food major food source with Victor Amoroso. And um, oh, she'll tell us a lot of uh, you know her from her multi prong projects, including farmer training during this chat. So Father Ben will speak first, and then afterwards uh, Mercy, and then. Uh, I'll uh, turn over the, the floor to Anne, and Anne will speak and uh, moderate the rest of the uh, of the chat. So, Father Ben, thank you. I'd like to share my PowerPoint. Okay, so um, I will make you a um, Father. I will make you a co-host. Okay. And then you can share your PowerPoint. And I think Glenn also has. So I will also make you a co-host. Everyone, in fact. Just tell me when I'm okay. Yes, please. You should okay. be okay. Please share. Okay. So uh, what I want to share with you is uh, work that I do with uh, Gawad Kalinga. Uh, Gawad Kalinga very recently has uh, launched uh, a program called Bayan Anihan. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a separate uh, organization from Gawad Kalinga because uh, it is kind of commercial. It has to deal with uh, buying and selling products. Um, it has a, a very young group. Uh, this is Colleen uh, managing it. And so they are very techy. Uh, uh, it will wait a bit because we're, uh, it's the now. I'm Market partnership. Is Chappie? Yes. Yeah. Can you give me a minute? Uh, can Can you wait five minutes? Yes. Uh, thank you. 
Can you hear us well, everyone? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But lately, talaga, the signals have become unstable. Eh? It's true. It's true. But still, Zoom is uh, effective. Uh, my right, Ross? Because, uh, ano, low bandwidth ang uh, ginagamit, di ba? Uh -uh. That's why it's uh, still highly successful. Still among the best. Uh -uh. So, um, Father Ben, maybe you can try because it might be okay now. Father Ben. So um, if you don't mind, Father Ben, maybe um, there. Ah, he's, uh, di he's reconnecting. I think he will use another. So Mercy, um, while waiting for Father Ben, do you want to speak about the... Uh, okay. Okay, Mercy. Father okay. Ben, um... yes. Our work is very simple. Uh, we are trying to improve the lives of the Lailayan and the poor farmers. Now with the farmers, uh, our tack is to gather them in clusters no? and circumvent the middleman. So we connect them directly to big corporations. So far, it has worked well. But the biggest challenge is to break down their mindset, you know, of, be, of just working alone. They're, they're not used to working as a team. So that's the first thing that we really teach them, how to work as a team. Now, um, so far, we've, had, we've met with relative success. Uh, we are able now to support Walter Mart, nine stores of Walter Mart we are supporting through the work of our farmers. So they are sure now of ready market. Then uh, we also uh, give to Chow King, the Jollibee chain of companies, and Mang Inasal directly. Where the farmers deliver directly. Then we, Max Group of Companies has have also opened up for us. So that's the entire Max restaurant, Densho, Pancake House, that's a whole slew of restaurants, the, including Yellow Cab Pizza. So it's so heartwarming to see the farmers now earning well. In fact, one team of our farmers, they were able to buy their own delivery truck and has paid for it fully already. <laughs> so it's not such a happy thing to see them earning well. It's not the middleman. And then it's such a happy thing to see that they're not uh, wallowing in debt like before. They could never recover from their debts. You know, every time it's uh, harvest time, it's just enough to pay for the, their uh, debts in the previous planting time. That doesn't happen anymore. And they're able to provide for their families. So it's just a very simple, um, what you call that program. But, but the most difficult part of it is really breaking down their bad habits. Okay. So in, in general, that's, ex that's what we're doing. Very simple, but very effective. Then it also attracts the younger, the sons, the children of the farmers who are abandoning farming already. And that's one of the challenge to, to attract the younger uh, generation into farming so that our old farmers will have a replacement. Yeah. Now, when you teach farming uh, as a business, then they can see that there is enough there.
to make a living. So Father Ben is there already, Giselle. Yeah, I think yes. in general, I have given you the That's, I think program, our program. For everyone's uh, information, before I uh, um, pass it on to Father Ben, there are 87,000 nanais all over the country enrolled in um, Mercy's Ashi program. Okay, 87,000. And they have a 1 billion peso credit line from Land Bank that they are able to pay, I think 95% or so uh, performance. So later we will ask- Well, that has, that, has not, that has gone down because of the pandemic. Yes. Gone down to 75%. Understandably, no? So yeah. now we uh, have to find ways for Paase to help you. Uh, let us know later how we should uh, try to help you, okay? Uh, so thanks, Merz. I'll now uh, turn over uh, to Father Ben. So you're connect. Okay now, Father Ben. Yes. Can you uh, screen share? You have to make me a co-host again. Okay. Make you again a co-host. So this is a new connection. All right. Okay. Great. Apologize, I have to find my PowerPoint. What's the title, Father Ben? Uh, it's, uh, Hunger Warriors? No. Pardon? Hunger Warriors? No. No, no. Uh -oh. uh, Baka itong paase school feed. Ayan. Ayan. Uh, Ayan, box F. Ayan, yan. Okay. All right. So. Okay. So as I was saying, uh, this is a program that's uh, uh, launched by uh, Rawat Kalinga called Bayan Anihan. And its role is to connect family farms to markets through partnerships. Uh, and it's not just the things we've been discussing, the challenges that face uh, uh, farmers, small farmers, uh, as they connect to market. Uh, we discussed the challenges they face. Uh, connecting to markets is the one I will dwell on. But we know also that financing is a problem. They have to borrow often at serious rates. Uh, we also know that they really need a lot of uh, uh, learnings from technologies uh, because they dealing, uh, planting hybrid seeds, for example, high yield varieties requires quite a bit of knowledge from them uh, and, and so on. But what I want to draw uh, to discuss, especially with you, is really the work that we do in terms of connecting them to markets. And so that's what I will. So how do, so Gawad Kalinga is going to connect them to markets, marketing support. That's the third thing that you see here. But we also will go through values formation uh, because we know that a lot of problems in their own families uh, can also create problems with them. And of course, business management support. So let me go. Let me go through the uh, what we do uh, with them, and then uh, uh, and then come back. Go to the marketing. So uh, as I told you, this is a young group, and so one of the things that they do is to provide marketing support. And so, for example, they 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 have QR codes. Uh, and uh, when you buy a product like this, farmer is a cacao farmer. And when you buy products from him, you can scan the code and it will tell you something about him. It will tell you that initially he had problems, but he's quite successful now. Earns around 36,000 pesos a month from what he does and has been able to help other cacao farmers. So it, it gives a description. Uh, it, 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 uh, we talk about relationships. So it not only connects the product to the market, but it tries to connect the producers, the farmers themselves to the market. So right now, the, uh, the program, uh, it, it connects uh, our kitchens to, uh, 
to farmers directly. So we procure directly from farmers in the area. For example, in Marawi, we procure from the from Lernau del Sur. Uh, the same thing with another group called Bukid Fresh and Trabacuan. So uh, you see here what we're providing for them, red onions, white onions, and so on. Wow. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, Kitchen City is a similar thing with, uh, it's, it's like a, so the, the group also provides to uh, hotels, restaurants, cafes, and Isabel's over there. And then Philippine planters fertilizers, their Clark and Tagin FTI sites, they, they require about four tons of assorted produce weekly. Um, Monheim, uh, they basically, uh, the big project for them that we provide is Saba. They, um, they need 60 to 70 tons of Saba every, every month. In fact, our problem is meeting, meeting the demand that they had. They also require fresh fruits um, and other fresh foods. SM is quite interesting. I, I don't know if you realize that SM earns 360 million pesos from selling Turon. <laughs> So we're trying to, so they need eight to 10 tons of sabah every month. And so the challenge actually is that, uh, uh, how, how, to meet that how to meet that demand. Uh, royalty is also another uh, one here. Um, cassava, uh, I'm especially interested in this because uh, a lot of our ATAS uh, really are into root crops. So we especially want to help them because they're among the poorest. And uh, Don Benito's, uh, the, the products that they have for cassava, they actually require 120 tons, uh, 170 tons a month. And so it's an opportunity for us to help uh, mainly upland farmers, in particular the ATAS, uh, uh, so that they can sell more. And then uh, for Christmas, uh, despite the lockdown, we're trying to promote Christmas by young market uh, baskets and so on. So th that that gives you some sense of the, what the group is doing. It's a very very young group. Uh, I could actually share uh, maybe better if they, they themselves share what they're doing with you. Uh, I know at least two or three of them personally, and uh, very young and very dedicated. Uh, the challenges that we face, uh, there are challenges both on the, um, uh, on, on the market side. Uh, sometimes there, there, there are months when they don't really need what we, what we, have, we produce uh, and the, the standards that they demand. And there are also problems on the producer side. Uh, discipline, uh, I don't know if you know what pole vaulting is, but sometimes farmers do not meet their contract because the, mark, the price outside in a fiesta is higher. So they don't meet their contract. In fact, I told the group that I lost a lot of money uh, in the 1990s uh, trying to uh, help farmers produce white potato in upland Bukid Non because they were not meeting their contract. Uh, that's why the values formation is very crucial uh, and uh, dealing with the farmers themselves. And so uh, we discussed uh, the values formation for the farmers, how to help them. Uh, have the discipline to uh, plant and to provide uh, uh, to meet their contracts. We also discuss how to provide financing because as you know, uh, farmers are always in debt. So uh, it, it, uh, for, the, for the seeds, the fertilizers, the pesticides, uh, they have to borrow to start and sometimes it's usurious rates. So no matter what we do to help them, they're already, they're always been debt. So Gawad Kalinga has been raising funds uh, from international donors as kind of a seed fund so that we can, uh, we can give, uh, we can provide farm, uh, fund funding for the farmers at, uh, at, at low interest rates. We're also providing a lot of friends. We're also contacting a lot of people who simply park their money in, uh, let's say, uh, uh, in the banks. Uh, if they could just allow us to use their money We'll give them the same interest rates at the banks so that we can take care of financing. So these are the challenges that we're looking at. Uh, one is the markets. 
but the other one is the surrounding environment for, for the farmers. Uh, and from our experience, I've also worked on this problem uh, when I was in Cagayan de Oro. And I realized that uh, markets, you need the markets, but you also need to handle financing and you have to handle the discipline of the farmers. Sometimes it's the farmers themselves who do not meet their contracts or who do not plant regularly. Uh, and so the, the, the producer who buys it from them uh, is going to give up. So that's where we are. Um, I, uh, it's, um, it's, it's starting. Uh, it's, it's a program that Gawad Kalinga is pushing ac across the country. Uh, we have a young team and we are hopeful that uh, this will grow in the years to come. So that's why I have to share and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father Ben. If we did not have this chat uh, today, we would not know about this yet. And to me, this is something that should also be shared with the NAST. I'm still curious why, uh, you know, we are not focusing on what I think is the most serious uh, problem in our country, which is poverty, hunger, and in your case, La Passage, malnutrition of children. So um, you have to leave before uh, 9 uh, a.m., yeah. but I think before we uh, ask, um, you know, the uh, group to ask questions or uh, uh, make comments, maybe we can hear first from uh, Glenn. Glenn? Yes. yes. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Good morning to all. Yeah, I, I enjoyed the talk of Father Ben. I know it's really, we could uh, see really the problems there, which I'll be relating to you also. I'll just to reinforce those, those challenges. Because sometimes we look at the, 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 the problems only with the traders or the industry, but we have to look also to the problems of the concerns of the farmers, which is financial, marketing, discipline, how to to be faithful with the contracts. So what I'll be sharing to you is what's happening among the value chains during the time of pandemic. I'll share my screen here, but I have to put it into a, yeah. So I just want to share here that the um, achieving food security in the Philippines and Southeast Asia, Shirka is, looking not only in the Philippines, but the whole Southeast Asia and beyond. Amid its growing population has been continuing a challenge. So having made more elusive, the food security becomes more elusive by the onset of COVID-19 pandemic. If you, we have a paper published just recently in the Asian Journal of Agriculture and Development. This is of, of COVID-19 pandemic production in Asia, which I want to highlight the result of, the, of our study, the disruption in agriculture, food systems create supply and demand performance, food security. Uh, actually reduces the volume, uh, production volume by 11 point, uh, by 3.11 per that is uh, 17 million tons due to the decline in agriculture and farm labor affecting about more than 100 million people in Southeast Asia, of course, including the Philippines. So the, our conclusion there is the uh, COVID-19 pandemic caused about 1.4% decline in the gross domestic product of Southeast Asia. That's the average, which is equivalent to almost uh, $4 billion. Look at... Uh, uh, food security, sorry. If you look at the food security in Southeast Asia, uh, um, using the Global Food Security Index, you could see here, you can see that there are different countries, including the Philippines. The higher the Global Food Security Index, the more secure the, the country is. Of course, Singapore, Malaysia is in the upper part, and of course, the lower middle part. Uh, or the lower part is the, the, uh, the developing countries in Southeast Asia. You could see here there's not much had been the food security in from 2015 up to 2018 has not much been affected. It's stable, but it's low. It has already stabilized or increasing a little bit from 2018 to 2019. It's going up, 
But this could not be sustained because of the pandemic. It might go down again. And you will observe here also the number of undernourished people in Southeast Asia from 2010 to 2017. So it's about 60 to 75 million people. Or about that is about 10 to 12 percent of the total population of the region. So clearly you could see here that agriculture, agriculture must not just aim to increase food production, but also to improve the nutrition status of the population. So it's really nice to say it's food nutrition and food security. Um, I could have gone down now. In my next slide, I'll just show you which I was asked to talk about the value chain. The value chain of, uh, you could see the, the, you could only appreciate what the effect of pandemic if you look at the whole value chains. Please note that the whole value chain was much affected by the, the COVID-19 pandemic that creates uh, the supply and demand shock affecting the relevant economic sectors, particularly agriculture. So you could see here that the mobility restriction has been affected as a result of the imposition of community lockdown initially. So some of the workers are young or too old, they could not, they could not go to their farms. So there's a reduce in agricultural productions is also caused by the farmers limited access to farm inputs and access to market to sell the produce, which may result to profit loss and wastage of farm produce. In the long run, the loss of this income and economic showdown, slowdown would also result to decrease in demand, particularly among the farmers and farming families with no safety nets. So among Southeast Asian countries, agriculture remains the employ direct employment as much as 60 to 50 percent of, of the population. So what are the programs and initiatives in response to COVID-19 pandemic? I think uh, the Philippine government is doing well here. As I mentioned, it, sometimes it's not being much uh, appreciated, but I think the agriculture sector in the Philippines has some stability in uh, buffering this, this problem. Of course, you will see a lot of news also. Some other areas had been affected, but you could see with this, uh, uh, with this uh, different programs and initiative across the value chain response to COVID-19 by the government, you could see the, the impact of the COVID-19 per supply chain mode. You could see the transportation restriction brought about by the lockdown, increased due to unpredictable market change of the consumer's purchase pattern, you could see also the buying behavior and the uh, preference shift in case of COVID-19 increase. So you could see the whole the demand side. And these are the different programs and initiative response to COVID-19, like the farmers, agricultural initiatives, programs for innovation, resilience extension project. We have a lot of Kadiwa, Ni Ani, at Kita. There's, I think the government is doing that. Open supply chain. And of course, the processors, uh, the processing area, I think there are some cargo lane and food pass accreditation, digital agriculture, I think our government is doing that. In the distribution part, we have some plant, plant, plant program, provision for farm inputs. I think there's, uh, there's something they're doing there. And thanks also for the price freeze under the state of calamity in the Philippines due to COVID-19 because many of our businessmen business also are capitalizing on this one and some purchase limit of the staple crops. So these are the government intervention, but take note the consumer's preference has changed. Uh, some people are more, they look at the nutrition side also. Shift of market schedule, e-commerce, urban gardening, social distancing, these are the different uh, on the consumer side has changed. If you read the article, you could see all the details in that, in that program. So. So there's in the COVID-19 have resulted to the change in consumer's preference actually. If you go to the, what we are doing at Circa actually is uh, in general, is just reinforcing, uh, reinforcing transform agricultural food system in the Philippines and Southeast Asia. Actually, we just developed our 11 five-year plan, which you have all the 
uh, innovations there that we oh, we aim actually to accelerate transformation through agricultural innovation. There's a very long story there, but you just visit our website and you'll see where we could partner with you. So in, in general, I just show this one, my last slide. This is the, our aim is to accelerate transformation through agricultural innovation, which uh, uh, Dr. Ben has really mentioned, I want to reinforce it. We have to change the farmer's mindset from the present to the future. From farming, we look at sometimes farming is just a production. It's a linear value change. We have to look at farming as a sustain sustainable agribusiness. We have to look at this as an ecosystem thinking and also circular value chain. On the producer and service side, we have to look at it as a Presently, it's a resource intensive, high waste its emission, all those problems you see, uh, human resource development, which uh, Father Ben mentioned a lot on how to, the discipline of the farmers. Uh, we, have, we have to transform them by embracing disruptive ag technology for future pro products and services with high efficiency and low ecological footprints using agriculture 0.0 and also developing the next generation leaders for agriculture and rural development. For our pre-play partners, before we are, farmers are heavily dependent on the government. Now we have to look at the transformational leadership. We have to, uh, government as, act as enabler, but we should have a strong support by the academic industry government interconnectivity collaboration. I think that's very important. Let's look, don't look at industry as the, the evil one, but they are the real partners here. We have to look at the academic industry government interconnectivity collaboration. Changing the mindset from value chain thinking, product centric analog, we have to look at the ecosystem thinking. We have to go into empowering the next generations, market centric, impact centric, digitally transformed, which Father Ben has actually mentioned a lot on this one. So these are the needed opportunities. We have to change the mindset, leadership, Accelerated transformation, new finance system, which Father Man mentioned a lot, new innovative methods in operations, new markets and business model, transform networks and new technologies. Of course, what at Sherka what they're doing is accelerated tra transformation through agricultural innovation in education and collected learning department. We have, we have research and thought leadership and the new division that we, we are launching is the emerging innovation management and implementation uh, in my this is my, I want to emphasize is really the the the, um, the higher educations higher educations are the key players in society's overall ability to achieve the aspired food security and economic development but they can aspire to contribute beyond towards economic development that is sustainable inclusive, and uh, friendly and most important resilient to the current future pandemic and other anticipated uh, disruption. So what I mean is the academic industry gov government interconnectivity should be, should, be, should be there. Thank you very much. Thanks Glenn for that uh, very, very informative um, overview of um, Sharka's uh, plan and uh, the DA's um, uh, ongoing implementation. So it would be good um, to uh, showcase uh, the, uh, the projects, the successful projects of the DA, uh, aside from the ones that we've heard from um, Father Ben and uh, Mercy. Uh, we are highlighting the important or the critical role of the public sector, of the private sector, of industry, okay, in this. Um, uh, Oh, may I security. So um, welcome uh, the other uh, participants in this um, chat. We are now uh, halfway through the presentations. And at this point, I'd like to turn over the floor to Anne, Andrea Lobos, okay, to talk about your program with Yas, and then afterwards uh, Gladys. And then we will uh, hopefully have a time for a little open forum where Father Ben is still with us. It's now yeah. 8.36. I think May I just uh, raise one point, Giselle? Yes. May I just raise one point? Yes. Uh, 
one of the problems I've found in our system is that a DA and DTI don't really coordinate. Um, I worked very hard on this in the 1980s and 1990s. I was giving the example uh, that in the, in the early 1990s, because of uh, the destruction of uh, cigarettes and poultry in Metro Manila, <coughs> the demand for corn dropped. And I was telling them, I was in uh, Rio de Oro at that time, I was telling them that the secretary of DA was very proud because they have, had a bumper crop of, uh, uh, of corn in Bukid Noy. But I was telling them that the, the, they were rotting in the fields because nobody was buying. And the problem is that the, the, the metrics that, that are used for successful DA is simply ends with harvest. At least at that time, it ended with the harvest, whether anybody bought it or not. And the metrics for DTI is simply the productivity of, say, of, 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 of maybe figuries and poultry, whether they buy their corn from Bukid Non or they buy it from Bukid, from, from, uh, uh, from Thailand. Uh, there has to be a better way of, of measuring success for our government agencies. And one of them should be like in, in the value chain, whether, whether they are part, whether they really see the part, of, they're evaluated and how they do on that, on that, on the value chain that Glenn talked about. Uh, because the farmer, farmer doesn't earn anything until somebody buys their product. And if, if, if it does not matter to the DTI uh, where, the, where the corn is bought, uh, then we have a problem. Anyway, this is something that maybe I present this because this is something that NAS maybe should talk about. Yes. Because um, I, I it's a high level uh, concern and I don't know that it has changed yet. Thank you, Father Ben. I think um, we should uh, oppose to um, uh, uh, President Rod I, hope, I was hoping she would attend this, but she's busy. There is a NASTA uh, meeting on the swaps for uh, the uh, top um, areas of, um, well, um, yeah, interest or um, problems in, in, in the country. And of course, I would always put food security at the top. So maybe we can start to discuss this uh, at that uh, swaps meeting, Father Ben. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, Anne, are you ready? Um, yeah, let me see yes. my screen. I will just turn off my, I will just turn off my video or else I will be cut okay. off later on. I okay, now, Anne, it's uh, your co-host. Can you share? Okay, yeah, I already shared. So um, this work that I'm, I'll be going to discuss will be, is in collaboration with the Philippine Foreign Expert Academician, Victor Amoroso, and also some of the analytical assays in collaboration with Yes Unio, as Giselle has mentioned. Now, the title that I have here is Bringing Back the Lost Value of Philippine Ferns. Uh, we know that ferns had been used by man as food since the beginning of times but seem to have diminished over time, especially with the influx of uh, designer foods, as they call it, and fast foods. So with a push to have diversity in the world food basket, a study was conducted by Central Mindanao University in Muswan Bukidnon, funded by DA Bar, to revisit the 10 edible ferns and at the same time, they are also medicinal as alternative food source by demonstrating their nutritive value for health and popularize ferns as alternative food source. Now, Paco, in this slide here with uh, the arrow, is the most popular. Its scientific name is the Plasium escolintum. Uh, commonly known as Paco all over the Philippines. And it is the one that can be grown easily. And actually it is the go-to medicine by the Talaandigs, the tribe at the ridge of Mount Kitanglad. Another fern, which is a tree fern here, is a go-to medicine for a tribe that lives in the ridge of Mount Kalatungan, both of these mountains are in Bukidnon. 
Now, these ferns have contain antioxidants, as shown here. We have analyzed all those, which are helpful in maintaining immunity and health. Uh, proteins as building blocks of many enzymes and biologicals. Then we have vitamins, minerals, and high fiber content. Now the protein content of the ferns are comparable to the protein content of the commercial uh, vegetables. I am also showing in this slide uh, the nutrient value, the nutrients in fiddlehead fern, which is a sword fern, which is the sought for fern in Northern America and uh, in Japan. Actually, uh, more likely some of these uh, nutrients may be present in the Philippine ferns also. That's something to be compared with later on. Uh, by the way, Yas will be uh, discussing the metabolites, the secondary metabolites for the ferns. And uh, propagation is an important part of this project because we wanted to maintain biodiversity in the mountain ecosystem in Mindanao. And then at the same time, it will be a source, the source of food and also of medicine. Now, all the 10 edible ferns were propagated in the fernery at the beginning to acclimatize and uh, cultivate them in small scale. And then later on, must propagate at the foot of Mount Mosuan. Now at the left side, that's the Paco fern that we have at the foot of Mount Moswan. Now, depending on the habitat of the fern, in this case, a pat, -a -pat farm is now in the lowland, which is in the rice paddies of uh, Central Mindanao University. Now, included in this slide also are the three species of ferns that are easy to grow and that it will take a shorter time for them to be harvested. The fronts are used as food here for all these ferns. Now, Asplenium nidus, which is bird's nest, is the dominant uh, fern sold in the restaurant market in Taipei. When you go to Taipei and then order food, uh, as they prepare it, uh, bird's nest is all over. Uh, I, I don't know where they have it. They might have a very large plantation. And then also, Asparagus like tasting of ferns like uh, teris and hagnaya are also easy to grow and can easily be harvested. So the cost and return analysis here are always included and these are the ones that are very successful and so as the other fer ferns. Now in order to as food, as fern a source of food we classify them as processed food. That's the first one. And the other one, garden to table. Now, in this case, we have vacuum packed pako so that they can, it can be available at any time and anywhere. So we are successful in this. However, the, co the cost and return analysis is a red. We are losing money unless we have large volume. Uh, pickles and dried noodles, which are also processed foods from fern, are those that are income generating. And hagnaya and other ferns can be made into tea. So you can have a healthy component in that tea and then also as flavorant. Now the flavorant is very versatile here because it can be used in chips, in cookies, in tart, uh, something into a candy and then flavorant. Uh, coming from fern, all types of fern here. Now, from garden to table, we held a food preparation contest in Central Mindanao University, participated by caterers, restaurant owners, and the CMU community. So, in the slide here are the winners of that contest. There are 10, one for each uh, species of fern that is a, a subject of this study. And out of the total of 26 dishes that was prepared that day, and these were judged by a sensory panel, and the food from fern spans from soup to salad to um, balls to pate to adobo and many others. And these are documented in a book uh, published by the Ibar, Edible Ferns and Fern Recipe Book. 
This book contains the uh, habitat, uh, taxonomy, and morphology of each of the edible ferns, uh, their propagation, their harvest, the harvest of the fronds for food, and also science of cooking, and naturally, the details of each of the recipes. And we have cost and return analysis also. So this is really income generating. And for the propagation of these 10 edible and medicinal ferns, we also have the IEC materials. These are easily shared to participants during our seminar field visit, uh, during training, and many other activities, meetings that we have here in CMU to, popular, to popularize the propagation of the ferns as alternative food source. Now, we also identified uh, farmer adapters. One of the adapters are the Farmers Cooperative uh, Inc. in Lake Balinsa Sayaw, which is a tourist destination in Negros Oriental. Uh, we collaborated with uh, national scientists Angel Alcala and his son for this project in Lake Balinsa Sayaw. And we uh, helped them uh, in the, we helped them and provide them some of the ferns uh, coming from Bukidnon and also planting them, preparing the area for the cultivation of the ferns and also uh, cultivation and propagation of these ferns. And then we also give training workshop on Main, mainly information and knowledge about ferns, the components, important components that contribute to health and, uh, and so on. And then we also have at the end, a cooking contest, naturally. And then you can see here bird's nest, agnaya, pako, and many other ingredients provided. And this is really a very success story for these farmers. Uh, now they have a fern garden that supply the 10 edible ferns to their nearby cafeteria. So the garden is just outside the cafeteria, which is a tourist destination. So they serve these dishes to the tourists. And then at the same time, they earn, they earn money, they earn additional income. And interestingly, these farmer cooperators are prepared the IEC materials for the propagation of ferns in their own dialect. So they can share it to their fellow men and farmers in other communities. And also we have identified uh, farmers in Bukidnon, in Davao, and many others. And may, we have other seminar field vis visits attended and participated by LGUs and NGOs from all over Bukidnon, uh, or all over Mindanao, and also the CMU community. So in this uh, slide, uh, I'm showing the tribes from Bukidnon and the Marilug District Davao City tribes during our training workshop, which was held here in Central Mindanao University. So you can see that they are learning and they are uh, learning about the science, the preparation of food, the preparation of noodles, and they have a share, uh, they taste it and it's acceptable to them. And uh, based on the training, they are using the ferns nearby in their community for preparing food. So that means with all the studies and with all the data and all the moves that we have to popularize uh, ferns as al an, an alternative uh, source of food, uh, it's easy for us, it's easy for us to transfer the knowledge of cultivation and propagation of ferns as well as food preparation to combat hunger and malnutrition during the pan pandemic and beyond. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Annabelle. Um, well, we are all um, thinking about pako at present. Oh, I can make a salad right now. Yeah, so it's, it's as much about um, yeah, changing uh, the mindset of uh, food uh, preferences, knowing uh, the nutritional value of um, uh, the, the food which you're looking into, as you showed in the, uh, the recommended daily allowance. So, uh, Anne, would you like to uh, introduce uh, Yas first, and then um, afterwards Gladys? Yes? Okay. okay, we'll have Yas, who will be presenting uh, another alternative food source, and also some of the 
analytical assays that they have conducted as part of the project on firms. Yes. Hello, good morning po. Uh, I would just like to share our results. So it's just going to be quick. I'm not sure if, can, can you see po my, um, I already shared my screen. So um, what I'm sharing with you now, it's, it's just a table of all of the compounds that we identified from the fern products that were, or the, from the fern species that were uh, discussed by Dr. Villalobo. So um, our, our work from my lab is to support the work that is being done by Dr. Villalobos and her team uh, in CNU. So basically, support lang po kami just to identify all of the metabolites that are present. Surprisingly po, there's a major uh, metabolite that is present in pako, and that is uh, phosphocholine, different types of phosphocholine. Um, and uh, based on literature information, phosphocholine uh, provides um, a lot of uh, benefits, uh, dietary benefits for, uh, for its consumption, which includes... Uh, basically, in the development of um, development of the brain, it also uh, has been. There's also been studied that phosphocholine also in, uh, improve cognitive function, and it also been shown to have uh, or aid in liver repair. It, apparently, it's also promote lipolysis or the breakdown of fats in the body. So maybe that's something that can be explored as an alternative way to consume ferns and to lose weight as well. So basically, we've just started the research on metabolomics for the ferns and we hope to continue the work in order to, by, by knowing the metabolites present in the ferns, we hope to uh, contribute to increasing the value of ferns as an alternative food source. So basically, po, that's our work with Dr. Villalobos. And then in terms of um, when we were discussing on what to potentially work in terms of research, um, Dr. Anne and I were thinking, uh, what are the products that can be con combined with fern in order for it to become a, an alternative food source? So Dr. Villalobos mentioned that sometimes what they do with the fern is they mix it with with. Uh, uh, certain parts of flour and then they use that to create uh, noodles and bread and other products. So we were thinking, how about if we suggest alternative uh, sources of flour, uh, which, which we can get from the Philippines as well. So um, the motivation for that in searching for this um, alternative sources of flour is because nowadays, if you go through Facebook uh, because of the pandemic, people are into baking. Um, and I know some friends who are experience shortages, uh, shortage uh, in flour supply because everybody seems to be want to be baking uh, nowadays. So we will, we, I was thinking maybe we can propose alternative sources of flour coming from really low-cost starting material. And one of those, uh, let me just share again my different screen uh, yeah, this one so this is just one slide so I'll just share it now so these are the two sources of, of alternative flour this is not something new it's all uh, it, I think it has been it's it's gaining traction in terms of being alternative sources of flour one is chesa which is known as also as canistel and the other one is breadfruit or rimas i think the depart there's an article which just came out recently discussing the importance of breadfruit as an alternative source of uh, flour or as an alternative source of carbohydrate and in terms of ad addressing malnutrition as you can see here uh, chesa and breadfruit has a uh, very rich amount of um nutrition, especially chesa, I, I don't think it's a very popular fruit, but in terms of its nutrients, it can provide uh, a lot of, it's just a good source of vitamin A and pro-vitamin A components. So I think it's a good way to explore 
uh, that chesa and breadfruit to be alternative sources of flour. So this is something that I'm really interested in. Maybe it's something that Dr. Villalobos and I can work in 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 addition to the, her their work in Fern because we think that if you have uh, alternative sources of flour, you can fortify it with other uh, alternative sources of nutrients such as fern and malunggay, and then you can uh, essentially create the product that's not only cheap in terms of the starting materials, but also provides uh, additional nutrients that can address the malnutrition. So basically, po, that is my contribution to this uh, morning's discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, very important contribution. I think that, um, uh, Anne, you agree that um, yes. here uh, in Pase, uh, the way we can uh, also help our um, uh, farmers in uh, creating or securing the food value chain is uh, to, um, well, uh, make available some uh, state-of-the-art uh, analytical uh, tools and uh, methods. Yeah, that, yeah, that yeah, that is really good because breadfruit is also a subject of a study here of Dr. Amoroso right now. And we are preparing different types of food from that, uh, food dishes from that one. So yes, that's really a great idea that we will. First. Yeah. And yes. then breadfruit is already known here. They already surveyed uh, regarding breadfruit in uh, Mindanao. So. That, that really is a good collaboration. Thank you, Yas. And by um, doing your analysis, Yas, you are adding value. You're uh, uh, confirming uh, the, uh, the value of the, uh, yes, of the uh, uh, food product in terms of its uh, uh, constituents, okay? yeah. its chemical by chemical constituents. So is your lab open now, Yas? Uh, yes, ma'am, we're operational now. Uh, we had some problems with the instrument for the last few weeks, but I my, I had a meeting with the RA, so and we're continuing our analysis as much as we can uh, provide uh, under the constraints of the pandemic, but we're, we're actively doing our research. For. That's wonderful to know. And uh, you, uh, well, uh, allow analysis uh, from, uh, well, the private sector or from uh, NGOs, right? Um. As of now, ma'am, we are just supporting uh, research on from academic institution because we need to. Uh, one of our issues now in accepting from private uh, entities is that we need to get a license to operate from PRC. So it's taking a little bit more time to process that because of the requirements that they they want from us. Uh, so. Uh, but 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 even if we don't have it from the private institution, we are very much uh, we have a lot of samples that are coming in from different research areas. So basically, we support a DDHP, um, Tuklas Luna, some of their program our samples go, go to our lab, and then we also support individual collaborations like our, my collaboration with Dr. Villalobos. But in, in the future, we would like to have. A facility that can also cater to analysis for private entities, so we can expand our services as well as uh, expand our, our our support for for the industry, especially in the. It's nine o'clock. It's I, nine o'clock. Yes. 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 I think Father Ben is uh, not here. Or are you still with us, uh, Father Ben? Uh, he's uh, left us. But I think uh, Al has a question. So. Uh, 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 no, it's more of a comment, Tias and Anne. There's a project that we're doing now with UP uh, Mindanao uh, in terms of converting banana, Cavendish banana rejects for export to convert it into flour. Yes, sir. And yeah, so we'll need to uh, loop up with you guys to join our forces together. I like, okay. and I also am uh, uh, Rick's uh, support for regional inclusive innovation for DTI in. Decol, and we've been trying to get metabolomic profile for pili pulp. So ah, pulp yes, pulp coating. We, oh, we, that's another work that yeah, uh, I wanted Sana to us to explore uh, here. Uh, sir, we started doing initially. We started doing the analysis on the essential the pili oil, 
uh, because we had the gas gas chrome instrument. But then when when we started doing the analysis, the gas chrome broke down. It, it's not my instrument. It was an old instrument in the Institute of Chemistry, so it broke down. So we were not able to finish the analysis. But now we have the mass. Sir, now, the peeling oil undertaken by Dr. Pham Apo. and Nico Dumanda in UP Las Banos. They have a published paper, very good analysis on both peeling oil extracted from the pulp and from the nut. Okay. So you can moving forward. But yeah. the pulp also, the profile for utilization of speed additive for the pulp might be another avenue that we are exploring for extra income for the Pili farm. I have a Pili farm that does 5,000 nuts a day that can yeah, provide can. us with the material. So we can do this. Yeah, we can do the, the profiling to serve. I mean, we would like to work uh, with as much people as we can because it's we would like to support uh, different regions. So we would be very much welcome to be working with you on this project. Thank you, Al. <laughs> Thank you, Al. Okay, so we'll have our next uh, uh, presenter, that's Gladys, who will be talking about breast milk and the importance for this um, advocacy. Thank you, Gladys. Yes, thank you. Let me just share. Oh, can, can you please make me a co-host? Oh, I thought I had done that. Uh, yes, please share. I, I was cut off. I see. Okay. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to share my the studies I've been working on the breast milk, and also um, what's the possible intervention we can do to to um, help in addressing malnutrition. So that's my title: addressing malnutrition from breastfeeding to food intervention. So I'd like to start with this number 1,000. As most of you may already know, this number represents the first 1,000 days of life that starts from the conception up to the second birthday of a child. And this number is very important because it, it gives the critical window of opportunity for the child's growth and development. And um, it turns out that Philippines is one of the countries with the highest incidence of malnutrition. As you can see here in the table, we are ranked ninth with the highest burden of stunting, meaning a low height for age ratio based on the World Health Organization growth standards median. And we're ranked 10th worldwide um, um, suffering from the burden of wasting. And based on statistics, one out of three Filipino children below the age of five is either wasted or stunted. But what's more alarming in the more, more recent survey, our country is actually suffering from the double burden of malnutrition. And what do you mean by this? This means that we have huge number of children suffering from wasting and stunting at the same time there is an increasing number of children that are obese and overweight. So clearly there is, there is a problem. And why is this happening? And I'd like to connect this with the breastfeeding attitude or habit of Filipino mothers. Although the World Health Organization and the Department of Health um, recommends exclusive breastfeeding ex ex uh, during the first six months, only very few Filipino mothers practice this. And in fact, where the Filipino families spend a lot of money in purchasing infant formula. And if you ask the mothers why this is happening, their usual um, response is because they're working or it's too inconvenient, it's a little bit hassle for them. But if you go to the poor communities, the most common response they will give you is that they're not actually producing enough milk. And so that means the mother itself is undernourished. So um, this is a picture of Jomar Bacaltos, which represents the face of the other 300,000 Filipino children 
with severe wasting, you can see that very thin bone structure, but huge head um, diameter. And also, there's a picture of Jessica and her daughter, Trista, is already two years old. And you can see from the body structure of the mother that she is also undernourished. That's why she had a problem of producing enough milk. And although she's, she's not earning enough, she didn't have a choice but to feed her daughter with the infant formula. But what's alarming is they thought in these poor communities, they think that feeding infant formula is okay because it's the same as the breast milk. Okay. So clearly there is a problem, although um, I'm happy that um, Father Ben mentioned earlier that, that in, in Malago, Malabon, there is a very active 1,000-day center, but I think there's still insufficient reinforcement of breastfeeding among Filipino population. And one of the reasons for that is that mothers are not that knowledgeable on the benefits of breastfeeding. And if you read, uh, read articles, there actually is an aggressive campaign of companies where they're claiming that. So there are these pamphlets being provided um, in the hospitals where they give even yeah, free huh? samples and they, claim, and they claim that these infant formulas yeah, no? are clinically to give the IQ and EQ advantage. And this, of course, these ads are very attractive and even seductive for poor mothers, of course, who wants the best for their child. So um, I'd like to share this study that were uh, very, um, a small part of the study that we did where we conducted seminars on breastfeeding, the advantage of it. And we also, of course, we needed to collect breast milk from the Filipino uh, volunteers, mother volunteers. And um, this is the part where I would like to talk about what are these human milk oligosaccharides? So as most of us know, these are the major components of the milk, where um, the major component is the lactose. And we have, of course, they have lipids and proteins. And the third most abundant um, component is what you call the human milk oligosaccharides, or HMO in short. And sometimes it even exceeds the amount of proteins, proteins present in breast milk. Okay. And um, these are the sugars or present in the breast milk or in the human milk oligosaccharides. There are what you call the, maybe you don't know, the glucose, the galactose and glucnac, and there are fucose and neuraminic acid or NUAC, commonly known as NUAC, which is also um, a high component present in um, what they call the, the bird's nest. Okay. And so this human milk oligosaccharide has a, is built on the lactose structure and they can be classified either as fixulated, sialylated, or non-fixulated. And so what's interesting about HMOs is that they're actually indigestible in the infant gut. So if, they, you will, if you analyze the stool of the infant, the, you can find these human milk oligosaccharides. They are present in the, the infant's um, stool. So if it's in the indigestible, what are the functions of this? Turns out they have a lot of functions. The first function that is very important is that they act as prebiotics. So they promote the growth of, sorry, they promote the growth of beneficial bacteria like the lactobacillus, the bifidobacteria, the clostridium. And so, and these beneficial bacteria um, promotes um, the growth of the short chain fatty acid in the infant's gut. And aside from being prebiotics, they also serve as what you call soluble decoys. So if you look at this cartoon picture, the structure of the HMOs or the human milk oligosaccharides are very similar to the structure of the glycocalyx, which is found at the surface of the epithelial cell. And because these act as soluble decoy, the pathogens, okay, don't um, was that attach to this glycocalyx anymore, but instead they attach to the HMOs and they are eventually um, become waste and the infection is, doesn't happen. And aside from uh, acting as soluble decoys, 
they can actually also have the glycomodifying effects where the, uh, the glycocalyx, other structures of the sugar or the oligosaccharides are being made, which of course will inhibit the, the binding of the pathogens. And another most important function of um, the HMOs is that they, are, they have cyanidated oligosaccharides, which are involved in, known to be involved in the brain development. And very recently also, they have shown um, early, the recent studies of Carlito's group, they have shown that fucose is also involved in the brain development, although this is still unpublished. Okay, so in our study, what we did is we collected um, more than 150 samples of breast milk, and we wanted to determine what types of mother do we have? Because the production of HMOs are actually genetically determined. There's what, so we can identify mothers are secretors or non-secretors. So it is based on the secretion of ABH antigens that are found in bodily fluids such, such as the breast milk. And so secretor mothers, okay, it turned out that they produce a lot of this 2 prime FL, this trisaccharide due to the expression of the gene fucosyl transferase 2. Okay, while the non-secretors, they don't have this enzyme, but they produce a lot of these neutral oligosaccharides, human milk oligosaccharides. And what, are, what is the importance of the production of these human milk oligosaccharides? So here, this is just generally, uh, the general population, usually there are 80% 80, 80 secretors and only 20% non-secretor mothers. So when we did that, um, our studies have shown that 81% of Filipino mothers are actually secretors. So they produce this 2 prime FL, a lot of them produce this 2 prime FL, and then 19% are non-secretors. Although they all, in terms of the production of the oligosaccharides, they are not um, significantly different in the abundance. So, and how is this important? What's the importance of this, the advantage of being a non-secretor or a being a secretor mom? So aside from, so both secretor and non-secretor moms actually um, helps in the protection of, um, what do you call that? Protection of healthy, my, healthy microbiota because of all those oligosaccharides present in breast milk the microbiota of the infant guts is healthier. But if you're a mother, if you're a secretor mar, mom, then a child that drinks your breast milk will, have, will be less prone to diarrhea and to other bacterial infections. But if you are a non-secretor mother also, you are the, your infant will be more resistant to the, the viruses, to viral infection. So those are the advantages of um, mothers be um, breastfeeding. Okay. That I think most of um, the general population is not really that knowledgeable. And so well, as I've uh, mentioned earlier, one of the problems that um, most mothers, especially from the poor communities, the reason why they're not um, breastfeeding exclusively is because they don't eat, produce enough milk. And so um, we even compare this, if you try to compare the milk content, the oligosaccharide content of the cow's milk versus the human milk, here you can see that there's a very small amount of oligosaccharides present in the cow's milk, only around 0.1%. So that's really the reason why um, it's still um, best to do breastfeeding. And we also had a study where we analyzed the oligosaccharide content of the buffalo milk. And although it has less number compared, so here, if you look at this, less number, 61 or total oligosaccharides versus the bovine milk, which is 100, but we have more than 200 human milk oligosaccharides. What's very interesting about the buffalo milk is that it doesn't have this new geek, a sialic acid, 
that is also not present in human milk oligosaccharides, but the cow's milk and the goat's milk have this new geek um, sialic acid. And there's a lot of studies have been uh, reported that new geek is actually uh, related to the um, people having, um, being, having cancer. So there's a lot of studies being connected to um, having new geek in our body being related to cancer. And let me now switch gears by, um, we together with Mam Giselle, Carlito, and with the UPLD, UPLD team, because of the problem of uh, malnutrition among lactating mothers and children below 10 years old, we would like to develop this, what we call a nutrient bar. So it's composed of rice, man bean, and moringa. And uh, um, I think, um, Mom Giselle, um, do you want to contribute on the present, um, the advantages of the moringa, the benefits of eating moringa? Okay, so um, I'll, I'll, I'm glad you thanks because it's so great. Uh, we're also showing a value chain here. So from um, yes. discussing the macroeconomics and the food value chains, we have this uh, talk uh, by um, Yas and Gladys on the basic science. It's so important. Uh, your work with Carlito and Ruel Nacario, who's also in our uh, chat now, is, I think it's very valuable. It's a PICARI funded project, right? And uh, yes. then uh, we're dovetailing it with a research that uh, I had on Moringa, funded by the DOST, the CHRD, on uh, the metabolites, the uh, uh, anti-cancer and uh, cancer chemopreventive uh, metabolites in uh, Moringa. And we had identified about six um, um, uh, compounds. And we had actually uh, done uh, the uh, uh, lots of assays on them for anti-cancer, including uh, um, effects on uh, metastasis and invasion. And then this uh, project was picked up by uh, YAS uh, with the funding from the USAID tribe. And uh, then and when we connected with Father Ben and uh, no, knowing uh, the uh, field studies of Dr. Enrique Ostrea of Wayne State U in Malabon, Malabon and Infants, we uh, thought, we thought that uh, Moringa is really worth uh, pursuing because uh, then I also had uh, the uh, analysis, uh, the macro analysis of uh, uh, Moringa Don and it is confirmed that it's very high in protein uh, carbohydrates, lipids, all the macronutrients uh, that we need in the body, as well as um, <clears throat> the micronutrients. It's full of um, uh, small molecules that are protective, uh, secondary metabolites, as well as, um, of course, um, chlorophyll, and also the important uh, minerals, calcium and iron, iron, very, very high in high iron. So um, Moringa would uh, meet the uh, minimum recommended daily allowance, and we just have to figure out the amount uh, that we would put in the nutri bar. But then uh, when we were looking at uh, other uh, uh, food sources, research at the Institute of Plant Breeding, uh, we looked at the uh, research of uh, Dr. May Mendoza on Mambi Narmungo, uh, together with other IPD scientists, and uh, looking at its um, RDA, very, very uh, high numbers as well. And so we are now thinking that we could uh, develop a Moringa and uh, Mung Bean or m, &M plus uh, food product. And Gladys came up with this idea of a Nutribar, uh, which uh, the UP uh, Food Science uh, Department could could uh, produce, and we're, we're aiming to do this, we would uh, add other things like a uh, you know, uh, source of vitamin A enforced. Okay, perhaps uh, make use of RICO, the rice corn uh, product of the IPB uh, to prepare uh, the Nutribar. So we're looking into uh, these types of uh, uh, products to produce for uh, Father Ben in his value chain and uh, have it distributed uh, in the uh, Ateneo Gawad Kalina Cusina, uh, Cusina 
and Imaria centers. And um, just to ensure that uh, the children have uh, food with the MRTA. So I think uh, that ends uh, the presentations of our uh, uh, key discussions. And so uh, thank you very much. And we would now like to open the floor to uh, your comments and questions. And please uh, turn on your videos if you wish or raise your hand and I will call you. There's Al. Um, that's Al with Just a question. To update, uh, uh, during the height of Yolanda, uh, there was a uh, uh, Negrances women that were providing mingo, moringa and mongo powder dehydrated already in Negros that we uh, mm. donated to mainly because they were close to Tacloban already. But they, their claim was one cup was enough to sustain the, and it's only add water, not even hot water, just add water. Uh, and uh, they provide enough protein and nutrition to sustain the people who have no access to food. I don't know if you've heard of it. I'm sure you probably, it's been seven years since that time. But I spoke to them two years ago when we were in this science uh, for a UP event and uh, they have scale capability of about a ton a month because of the Yolanda experience and clearly to me rechanneling their productivity and efforts towards addressing the first 1000 days law might be an option if we can back it up Gladys and Giselle that uh, with the right formulation that will promote both uh, lactating mothers as well as uh, the requirements of a 1,000-day baby, I mean, a person. So, but we need some clinical proof somehow. I know I visited Carlita's lab. I did ask him the same questions. Bifida is not useful here because we have bifida. <laughs> Our, uh, uh, yeah. That is the next thing that's better was about the question that I've asked you, but you've answered it already, Gladys, that it's more towards <laughs> helping mothers. So clearly this is one of those, and I do having uh, 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 also wanted to support growth stunting as well. Uh, this would be a, a good solution towards that, but we need clinical proof so we can sell it to the NGOs and the foundations uh, for great. them to support it. Well. Oh, you know, um, for a clinical proof field um, studies, for Moringa, uh, we have it from uh, Enrique Ostrea, a NAS corresponding member, MD, neonatologist. Okay, he worked on this. Okay. And uh, it was funded okay. by the PCHRD. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, ask PCHRD about it. We're trying to connect with Enrique again. Okay? But uh, actually, yes, uh, powder that's uh, readily available at, uh, at this time. There's an organic uh, version of it uh, that is produced by Green Earth uh, Heritage Foundation, Mylene Pinafuerte uh, Mati. And uh, well, always the problem, I think, uh, Al, is the, um, uh, the powder does not readily. Uh, dissolve or mix uh, with any liquid like water, but it does with milk actually. So you can actually do a kind of a, a smoothie with it. And so uh, Gladys and I are thinking of uh, also doing the bioavailability studies either yes. with the FNRI or with the UP uh, food science uh, labs. Okay, so I think uh, there's a little bit more work to do, but it's great to connect us with the Negro source because. When we had a meeting with the IPD scientists, they said the problem always is sourcing it in large quantity, whether it is Moringa or it is Mongo. You'd be surprised. We cannot meet the demand of the tons that uh, Father Ben and uh, Mercy are saying, you know, the private sector or, you know, other industries. So we'll find a way to do it. Yes. Uh, oh, Mercy, do you know of the Negrantes women, Mingo? Uh, I was connected with the uh, group. Uh, my wife's from Assumption, that's why. But they had a group that was uh, donating uh, to uh, Yolanda back then. The product's it, called Mingo. Is it an Assumption Mingo group? And Mongo. Uh, is the it key. a Pacolod? Pacolod group? Uh, it's Pacolod. It's both the Pacolod, okay. yes. All right, we'll find it's out. Huh? I will look for that connect. Yeah. Yes. Mingo. Yeah. Okay. I met their head. All right. And then Ilo Ilo. Oh, well, Ilo Ilo. Tans. Oh, of course, I can connect with Assumption Iloilo. Ilo. Uh, Kevin Villanueva is a, an alumnus of Assumption Iloilo Ilo as well. So I think uh, Glenn has something to say. I'm almost sure Glenn was trying to raise his hand. Glenn, please. 
Ito ba? I did not raise my hand. <laughs> so, but... <laughs> So it's, yes, it's really, you, you, are, you are right, Giselle, na Mongo and Moringa, you have the volume problem because I, I went to the industry and they asked, they could not supply us the, the Mongo. I think Mongo, we are importing Mongo, 90% of Mongo is imported. I think you have only one big area in, in Isabela who was producing Mongo, this is San Mateo. And some are in Visayas and Mindanao, but small part, but I think 80%. But that's only maybe five percent of our Mongo requirement is produced in the Philippines. We're buying it in Australia, in Myanmar, and China. But in our case, so uh, I went to SNR and I saw I bought the Mongo pack. It looks so nice, okay, and I love it. But then, uh, well, uh, Gladys and I and me were saying, even if we have to use imported, just as proof of principle, the right? yeah. we can uh, show that the M and M bar or whatever the powder. We have to do the bioavailability first, but we also have to put it in form that is attractive to our children, school children. For the mothers, pwede naman yung powder, di ba, Al? Wow, that is a great resource. If you have it uh, in uh, Negrense, in Iloilo, we can find that source. Yeah, I mean, it's reformulated those specifically for this use case. Yes. So that's one thing I always tell people. You may have the right technology, but if you don't formulate it properly to exactly. a particular customer, uh -oh. you may not succeed. So that, that is where uh, yeah, the market, like, uh, you know, Jollibee or Chow King or whatever, maybe they will also be into this nutri bars, no? But I'd like to ask Mary Jane. Mary Jane is uh, uh, there, uh, very near Isabella. I understand when he visited Anne, when they visited uh, CSU and Mary Jane, um, I think they have a, like uh, also a coverage, coverage uh, all the way to Isabella. Are we right? Mary Jane, would you like to yeah. say something? Yes, after conception. Yes. Mary Jane, hi. Good morning, Hello, everyone. Yeah. Good morning, Dr. Anne. Hello. Dr. Glenn Gregorio, good morning. Hello, good morning. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, Actually, Giselle, on the supply side, you have to look also because I'm doing some mongo breeding before. So you have to look mongo also. There are three types of mongo. Mongo for toge, mongo for soup, and mongo for yung sabi lang powder. Kasi yun ang, so those are different quality. For the supplies, I'm a plant breeder. So we develop mongo for toge type. Kasi that's also a very good source of vegetable, tong toge, na kailangan natin ikwan. If you go to Southeast Asia, Thailand, Vietnam, Lahat ng based of uh, soup nila may toge. And I think we have to develop mm -hmm. that. So it's a nice, from the supply side up to the demand side, you have to look at it. It's a very beautiful uh, yes. okay. study, so actually. You can uh, ask Mary Jane to look into the sources of Mongo uh, from Isabella, all the three types. No? Uh, I, I hope uh, there's a chance for Prost to, in, to input on uh, you know what you uh, see might be an opportunity to further connect our... Um, you know, um, the, the value chain. But uh, also, uh, I hope there's a little time for us, uh, Glenn, Al, and everyone to uh, discuss what we call our um, uh, home, our garden uh, farming. Because uh, to be honest, in my backyard, you know, I'm able to grow uh, veg um, vegetables, um, moringa, okra, and Eggplant, 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 you know, successfully. Okay, and I know these are all uh, nutritious food, even eggplant. That's why we have beet it along because it is a cheap, nutritious uh, vegetable, you know, affordable to so many. But do we have a teaching program for doing this for self sufficiency? You know, so I think that's important, uh, Mercy, for uh, your nanas to, uh, to promote. Yeah. You just told us that they grow for themselves and then yung kanilang excess. Now, the idea of the community or the cooperative uh, growing together in a, what? Is it a common plot of land aside from their backyards? Or maybe you can describe it to us and then uh, maybe um, Frost has something to say about it. I have uh, Joyce Ibana here with lots of great ideas. Uh, maybe you can also input. Nova Ramos, thank you for joining us. And um, AJ. Uh, Sagut, thanks for joining us. 
So the floor is open. Yes. Anybody? Rainier Mendez? Yes. Ed Rodriguez? Yes. Uh, there is an effort towards uh, in UPLB right now, indeed, to uh, get the, the complete set, the SNAP solution, the urban farming capability to be deployed. We have a, we're forming a new technical working group. Uh, maybe I'll get some input from Glenn as well. But uh, there is demand. Clearly, uh, I was asked last year by uh, Father Anton Pascual of Caritas Manila to uh, deploy urban farming capability to Baseco compound. And I've yet to come back to him. And this is the same things that I can supply Mercy, probably the same technology that your non can definitely use to increase. There's an urban farm group, uh, German guy, that was presented with Joel Coelho uh, recently. And they tried to do it in Tondo last year, but it didn't scale up, apparently. It was a curiosity, but didn't scale up, mainly because the feed solutions were not uh, available and expensive to start with. That's why Father Anton were asking me, Al, can we do production of SNAP solutions, which is the one that you use for hydroponics uh, in the urban area. So, it's, again, it's an same approach. We need to look at all the supply chain, the equipment, the worker, the market as well. And it's moving forward. We have uh, a bit of that. And I think uh, as we uh, progress in this effort, uh, we'll keep everyone posted on how you can help, maybe from Metabolomet, CS, or Gladys. It can be uh, supporting the 1,000 days and the lactating mothers. Glenn can obviously uh, address the species and agricultural issues. And Joyce, I mean, you're equivalent also in the car uh, You have a Carabao uh, uh, production. <laughs> you're very close to uh, the Philippine Carabao Center. Maybe the carabong's milk can also have a play in this one. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so, Al, thanks for that. But uh, I think what we would like uh, to emphasize to uh, uh, Mercy, who's in touch with her nanas who are uh, you know involved in production, is yeah, Pase can uh, help in uh, maybe uh, producing the, the tons that are required by uh, the uh, private sector. And uh, Al, we should focus on uh, the harvest the planting, the harvest, and post-harvest mechanizations. So we have in Paase uh, members, engineers, who may start to build uh, equipment that are required uh, by the uh, the farmers and the nanas. So uh, let's look into yes, that. Please. Then, yes. Courage, uh, the hydration. Uh, wants to speak, I think. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, Al. Meron. Meron. Okay. For you, just, uh, just ask. Meron. I know. You know, I'm very excited about Earl Grand Reb uh, Wanico in uh, TIP. I think uh, their team and the son of, uh, of Beth Lajos is into it. They can build equipment for us. Okay? So, Joyce, we'd like to hear you. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you, Giselle. <clears throat> well, Well, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone because it's... Uh, I, I'm kind of new, actually. I, I'm realizing now that I don't know a lot of things in the value chain, and I'm I'm a, more of a basic scientist. But we're finding uh, little uh, uh, things about carabao milk and um, uh, and uh, seeing how it's their similarity with human breast milk, and also um, what I'm trying to do right now. I'm trying to to focus on where I could add in this in this value chain. For example, when I look at Hia's um, data on the Yunchesa, so it, I, apparently it has a lot of tryptophan um, content. And something that we're trying to develop in our lab is yung mga assays for kung anong, anong uh, pathway, for example, this is important. For example, tryptophan is so important in um, serotonin pathway and if you have infection, uh, when you have um, this enzyme in dolamine 2,3-dioxygenase, it will go to the kainurinine pathway. So we're trying to develop like what food you can put with high tryptophan so that it will be skewed towards, um, this is important for things like depression, yung mga ganon. So in isip ko, there's so many, uh, saka sleeping. So, Na, tapos nakita ko rin po yung kay Ma'am Dilia Lobos, yung how you can actually package the whole product. For example, focus on fern and you you have a cookbook. So I, I thank you all for yung mga ideas on what we can do, for example, focusing on carabao. 
So I am just learning here, and I'm I'm very grateful for your for your input. At kasi medyo and dami ko na umpisahan. I'm moving them paunti unti lahat. Pero na, 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 hindi ko na alam kung paano yung value chain. So I'm just learning po. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, Joyce, for everyone's you, uh, information. Joyce is an artist, artist scientist. And the way she thinks is uh, very creative and holistic. Kaya baka mamaya matutulungan pa ni Joyce, si uh, Mercy at si Anne about, you know, uh, the uh, evo evocative part of, uh, you know, the work that we're doing. Through art, no? So, uh, yeah. Uh, Giselle, yes. Giselle, 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 yes. you're yes. so well connected. Can we ask our government institutions to keep on communicating via media? Because our people are so ignorant, like the Tiesa. You go around the barrios, yes. it's just falling, 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 falling from the falling. tree. Wow. Nobody, wa yes. nobody, and they were only one who's eating it, and they will say, Yuck, mom. Yes, so valuable and ignorant. They love, they love, eh. Ang daming vitamin A dyan. Kaya nga. And, and then they're wondering why I'm eating, ano, pako. I, I grew up on pako in Kamigin Island. My, my vitamin During the war. That's, oh, yeah. Oh. yeah. So I mean, but our people are so ignorant. It's natural really. product. So, um, Glenn, syempre, yung vitamin A rice, yung uh, golden rice natin, no? so much technology and to uh, you know to add vitamin A to our diet no of course that is ako naman i always think also of staple syempre yung ba cereal you have to address that and then you have your uh, your uh, you know protein diet and all the other stuff no so we also have to approach uh, so much wealth of information right? yes. yes this morning i know and it's all kept in the book well it it Sayang. yeah it's um, so valuable well i'll tell you but, 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 we, we just, will be go, we will be going back to the volume pag sila yung tiesa volume. but hindi siya if i'm a manufacturing company is oh. a small scale hindi not all seasons available yun minsan isang puno lang doon isang puno dito so we need volume so balik ulit tayo sa problem planting oh, oh, yeah, so, yeah, we can plant that we can plant I have, oh. I have one proposal Giselle we have yes. this uh, i we were approached by the Department of Agriculture, they have a plan to establish the National Seed Technology Park at Clark. Uh, they have already some money. We are developing the business uh, model dito. I think this is, I think this is where Paasi could really help because everything starts with the seed, good source of seed. We are, this will be a, a growth for seed industry, ensuring use of high quality inputs, modern technology, processing, post-harvest, hanggang demonstration. I think this were, I think Paasi could really help. I think yung mga pinag-usapan natin, we could help out because this is uh, where the academy, academy could could join in to, because they, they will be offering the the processing area, the quarantine, the the market, the linkage for a national seed technology park. So this will, in agriculture development, seed is very important. Start with a good seed. Right. So, Yes, a seed bar to grafting to tissue culture to developing hybrids up to <coughs> even GMO. Dito yon maging hub niya. So we will have good seed technology. I think we are we are now developing the business model for this. I think uh, Al will be very very helpful dito. I think we yeah, could uh, Paase could really help dito, and we could ways. direct the one. I could share to you the. The, uh, the the proposal and we're developing the, the blueprint. So I have actually with me the the National Seed Technology Park and uh, it should it is funded now with two hundred million mm -hmm. starting money and this is where we could really have um, modern technology for processing and market linkages. Actually, an objective dito is to stimulate <laughs> innovation, generate economic benefit. For the for the for the business and the farmers, because that's the assurance of business. Natin, ng ng seed it start with a good seed, and everything will will follow. Start with a good seed. Actually, can see man, she Lagman has been uh, funded by Stride uh, five years ago, and has been moving for both cacao and coffee for genetically tagging and the uh, perfect varieties, and we've been deposited in. Uh, Cavite State, but definitely she completed including GIS mapping 
or where to locate the plantations for coffee. It's a holistic a project. That, it's an example of yeah. right about fifteen. So, pwede, pwede, uh, I think uh, Pros, meron talagang opportunity dito, Pros Naval, no? Dr. Pros Naval, uh, who's the the, um, the director of the uh, computer science. Uh, yes, Pros, for the IS, for, for, uh, for me, uh, al, ang, ang, ano natin dito is major uh, food crops muna, no? Pero yung uh, modelo ni, uh, uh, ni Menchi talaga from a very successful Stride grant, uh, it's, it's very good to adopt. Uh, yeah, um, may I be allowed to comment, uh, Giselle? Yes, thank you. Uh, so, uh, your father Nebris and uh, I think Mercedes talk about their um, initiatives to help the farmers to connect the farmers directly to the uh, to the consumers, no, not consumers, but the companies uh, like Jollibee and and all this. Uh, uh, yeah, restaurants possibly. No, I think it's it's really a very good idea. And uh, Father Nebras brought up the um, the brought up uh, values formation as uh, something that's crucial. Uh, we can easily make apps that can connect people, that can connect farmers, fisher folks to uh, consumers directly. However, I think uh, the bigger problem would be the attitude of the farmers and the fisher folks, um, the discipline. Um, I think we should invite uh, Helen Yap to talk about uh, what we did. Um, I'm sure just tell you're familiar with with the, the study that uh, we did. Um, yes, yes. I published two papers, uh, in, two journal papers um, uh, on, uh, on that. No? So more of uh, not so much the the technology, but the uh, the the social aspect, the attitudes of farmers. So why are they still, you know, despite being given uh, opportunities, still mired in debts and so on? Uh, it's the attitude, no? Because um, you see, as a fisher folk, uh, as a farmer, uh, life is very difficult. No? So. Um, when they are given a little bit more money, what they do is they spend this for entertainment. So they uh, they have uh, television, but then in the provinces, uh, uh, the usual the usual uh, form of entertainment, especially among the men, is uh, drinking, <laughs> drinking and uh, and sabong. Unfortunately, you no. Know? So. Uh, any additional income actually goes to to that, no? Because uh, we cannot really blame them because life is difficult, no? So, so uh, I think that, that there has to be a a social or or a values formation initiative, no? Like the one promoted by Father Nebris, and and this will actually be the one to help them get out of uh, poverty. So even if you give them all the implements, the technology, uh, in the end, any little additional income that they receive will be wasted. Uh, will will not be um, will not actually help them. Will not actually help their families. No? So it's really a big, very big problem. It's more than using science, uh, technology, all that. No? So the social the social aspect is yes. you know, the values formation aspect, discipline, and all that is really very important. And it is crucial, in fact, so something that we cannot ignore. Um, and it is something that uh, is very common. So I think we should invite uh, Helen Yap uh, to talk about the insights that uh, we got from that, uh, uh, from this, the, the studies that she made. Uh, so, so that's one, one thing that I'd like to say. And the second one is uh, smart agriculture. So AI, as we know, is all over. And uh, and it's, it's being used now in agriculture to, for example, detect crop. I mean, detect diseases, pests in crops to monitor health of uh, the soil and 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 uh, and the crops themselves. Uh, we have drones that actually move around to uh, to determine which parts of the you know huge farm will need uh, you know. Insecticide or whatever, what, which parts are sick, 
which part so is it time to harvest this uh, grain because uh, you, know, you know from the cameras from from above you can actually determine that so i think the technology is actually the longer you might say advanced technology is now being commoditized no it's uh, being it's not common to have this no it's you can buy a drone for maybe 5000 pesos no uh, maybe for of course for a commercial system you need a bigger one and more expensive one but it's really within the reach of uh, a lot of people now and even ai is also even is also within the reach of uh, it's no longer really high tech no because it's really being democratized no so i think we should take advantage of this um, to to have uh, innovative solutions for smart agriculture it could be in the form of putting sensors in the farms or drones that go around and check the health of uh, tobacco farms or rice uh, farms or so all these things are are you know some, this is something that we can already do in the Philippines uh, and it's no longer um, high tech we might say that it's only a few can do it no we can do it we can a lot we have now young students or young engineers and, and technologists who can who can do all these things so I, I would like to pitch for that no? so uh, encouraging people to get into to go into smart a smart agriculture I'm sure uh, Al has a lot to say about this as well um, yeah I think Lulu has uh, something to say and then Al okay Lulu yes thanks yeah. Cross, huh? Very valuable. Okay, um, I just want to mention something. I'm a little bit shocked about the statistics on malnutrition in the in Southeast Asia, in the Philippines too. So perhaps education, K to 12 education, will help in educating them about um, paco, moringa, uh, nutrient, nutritious uh, in in are they indigenous plants in the Philippines that they can even uh, grow in their backyard, uh, educate them. And when they become mothers, they themselves will yearn for Moringa. So they will have, isn't that one of the things that uh, is a plus to, to create their milk? So they will, so I think uh, K to 12 education should beep up nutrition education. That's what I'm suggesting. Very important, uh, very, very valuable. And uh, Lulu in the rec uh, on education, you could actually decide on what uh, materials uh, you could develop if you want the focus uh, to be on uh, food and nutrition. I mean, you could uh, develop this uh, type of uh, uh, material. But uh, going back to uh, what uh, Mercy said about what, um, <clears throat> Yeah, we're doing in Pase to try to organize our materials so that uh, we would have more publicity. We're actually uh, in, in the process of thinking of uh, coming up with our, our YouTube channel, uh, Pase YouTube channel. And it just uh, 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 dawned on me that maybe uh, the framework that we use as our thumbnails, and I shared this with Al the other night, is uh, the uh, thumbnails of the UN's 17 Sustainable Development Goals. So there are 17 areas there, thumbnails. And you know our hundreds of talks in PASE and our discussion groups, uh, they would fall into any of those 17 uh, SDGs. And I think, uh, you know, by uh, trying to use that as our framework, immediately uh, if you have that, for example, in your website, as part of your uh, PASA YouTube channel. And then we have a mascot or we have a champion where we would have interviews of us, okay? Uh, the uh, you know, PASA members on any uh, subject at all. And I'm thinking of Atom Araulio, okay? Atom Talks, okay, for PASA, with interview PASA members. Then uh, immediately when you search, you know, SDGs, it pick up, it picks up anyone or everyone who uses uh, that framework. So it's just an idea. But uh, Mercy, yes, we're trying to organize uh, the information. And then as far as cross uh, comments are concerned, mindset, 
change of mindset came out in the talks of Mercy, Father Ben, and of course, Glenn also. Referring to Mahela Helen Yap, that is a UPE IDR program called One Ecosystem, led by Helen with Ross and um, social scientists from CERP, right? It's uh, Joseph. Uh, is it Joseph? Uh, or the other brother, I mean, Alan, I forgot. Uh, well, they came up with many um, analysis of a complex system and they were dealing with Mangyans. So, Anne, you're dealing with Aitas, okay? Uh, growing the ferns. But Helen and Frost and their team, is it John Rabantang also of physics? They came up with a study uh, that's been published and it's on a complex systems approach to uh, the analysis of uh, what you know uh, conservation and productivity would be in uh, it's in Mindoro uh, Occidental, right? Abra de Ilog. Yes, one of our uh, top EIDR um, projects. So um, it's so good that um, Ross, you're offering uh, smart technologies, and uh, I hope that Sharka is aware of what um, Ross. Um, expertise could bring, uh, say, to uh, the DA, maybe connect with the DA. Uh, Mercy, if there's anything that uh, you would need guidance on, there's Frost and his team, okay, that's uh, also developed one of our leading technologies in uh, UP, which is fish eye. Fish, uh, fish eye. Yeah. Yes. Giselle, I just want to mention quickly yes. with uh, Frost and Frost here, we are launching tomorrow, we'll be launching our Innovation Olympics. This involves the, the youth, the college, the Innovation Olympics will be, our theme is a precision agriculture. So we are, we are inviting a team of uh, youth, including out of school youth, at, at least some out of school youth and uh, college level or high school up to masters. Then they will form and create, uh, they will pitch to us their innovation on digital agriculture or precision agriculture. Then we'll, we'll get one from Miluson, Visayas, Mindanao, I think five finalists, then we will give them some money for a startup to, to, to show what will, and we'll be giving mentors. Then after that, after four months, they will come back and we'll be having the Innovation Olympics. They will pitch again what they have, uh, we, they got, then we'll be awarding first, second, third, and we'll be helping out for them to have a startup project. So those are just a simple way of Circa is doing with East West Company, with Sengent and with UP and the universities from CLSU, CMU, and uh, Visca State University. So those are just example of how we are uh, doing digital agriculture right now. Fantastic. So let me tell you, um, Glenn, before I ask uh, Al again to speak, and then uh, I would have to refer to your uh, National Seed uh, Bank program. I think that is a very, very important program that we should all support, starting with the UP Los Banos Institute of Plant Breeding. Okay, and uh, uh, I think uh, I benefited during COVID from receiving the seeds from the Department of Agriculture. They were uh, distributing this for free. So talagang merong uh, advocacy si Secretary Darge and sir seeds. Pero how do you grow the seeds properly? Para nun, you know, talagang uh, they will uh, be able to, uh, uh, well, uh, communities and homes to be able to, uh, you know, grow their own yeah. as well. Actually, as we could organize because at, at okay. Circa, we have the okay. School Plus Home program, School Plus Home project, which is we are uh, introducing it. We have already private school. We have already the, the pilot school and they are now nanganganak na yon, and they have, we are now have 98 schools or developing the School Plus Home program. Now we are focusing on the home because Marami ay wala na sa school, punta kami sa home. And now we are expanding it it's in Boswanga and even in, in Cambodia. So I think there's a lot of projects around na pwede nating itap and we could scale it out. And it will really help. Uh, kasi hindi natin alam eh. Yung may maraming projects tayong hindi natin alam na nung iba. So it's just a matter of consolidating them and we'll work together. And I think that's beautiful. Oh, you know, uh, yung kinuwento mo rin na uh, yung, uh, yung uh, Olim Olympic. Yeah, Innovation uh, Olympics too. Innovation Olympics. Actually, in-institutionalize na yan ng AIM. Yung kay Chris Monterola, kay Erica Legara, 
yung kanilang masters uh, in uh, innovation and business. Ang dami nilang estudyante doon na ang kanilang thesis defense has got to do with uh, you know, presenting it in three phases, in three stages. Pitching, pitching, pitching. And of course, it's all mostly focused on developing the apps. So Actually, most, yeah. Oh, oh, Last oh, year, for any industry. Ooh, our, our, in, yeah, our Innovation uh, Olympics, Innovation uh, Olympics uh, 1, ang nanalo ay estudyante ng AIM. Sila yung nanalo. Yeah. So just to give you an example. So, and many are really doing it. And they are, yung nanalo ay may business na sila ngayon. Oh. Mga innovation, MS in innovation, industry innovation graduates sila. And ngayon may business na sila. Nag-full time na sila doon. So just an example of some outcome. Oh, oh. So, That's why we have the innovation. So, talaga, talagang nakakapaghanga talaga yung AIM. And the, yun yan. Yun na yung seed ng UP na nandun na sa AIM. Dahil nandun sila Chris and Erica. Alam mo yung mga projects nila is may corporate social responsibility and it's on the uh, public good projects agriculture aquaculture health etc plastic pollution energy na din ko lahat yan maraming taga UP pero marami ring mga mayay, mga anak ng mga mayayaman na can uh, implement it uh, on, on, as a business no including urban planning anak ni uh, architect Palafox is already with an app on urban on a city planning and I, I know it because I sit in uh, as a panelist uh, in the thesis defense. No? So um, probably you're referring to the coffee guy or uh, the rice, specialized rice products uh, couple in Isabella. Merong ganyan. They're already into their startups. So I'm saying it's starting and it's uh, the real uh, no, um, way to it is really through uh, AI and apps uh, cross. Because every step of the... Uh, agriculture process from uh, farming production post harvest at the pwede talagang inaano nila mina monitor nila nagkakaroon na sila ng metrics yun din ang mga tinuturo ni ni Chris at ni Erica no data data gathering tapos ano uh, metrics for um, for um, quality so um, i think um, uh, it's starting to come to a head i don't mean na kailangan talagang paas na merong uh, unique or uh, you know uh, publicized contribution. Di naman tayo ganun, Al, di ba? We're not that way, Lulu. No. As long as we're able to help, we're fine. Okay, we know uh, in our hearts, uh, internally, that we are able to help. And uh, Mercy here is already way ahead of us. So it's amazing. Amazing. To her life's career, ang dami na niyang ginawa for public good. And now, like Father Ben, na-realize niya, Talagang you have to go back to the nanas, you have to go back to the farmers. Because mukhangang talagang ano, uh, it's cultural. It's a social problem, no? Ross, you uh, said it so, uh, I think, uh, eloquently and you, you hit the, 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 you know, the nail on the head. So, um, Al, any other uh, words of wisdom for the, the whole of us, okay? that you want to share? We need to uh, create teams hmm. of mercy, the, yeah. the, the real people in the front lines who know the real problem yeah. and what they, use, what they need to help them. And then what we do is like Glenn is presenting us with a whole analysis of the value chain. And mercy can say, yan, yan, kailangan ko yan. Ito, hindi masyado, yun. And then we tackle the problem as a team and look for stakeholders that are willing to pitch in and support and technologists in the Paasa team that can also contribute to the solution. So ko, the way it works is it starts with the user need and I would love to support Mercy and Father Ben in your efforts but clearly well, thank you when, so much. Uh, Dr. Yeah, we're, we're really we are gathering gathering, uh, you know, coming to a head about this. Thank you, Al. Uh, you know, Al, uh, I think Father Ben, we are just going to be behind Father Ben uh, in NAST to try to bring this uh, to the attention of the NAST and uh, uh, the DOST, the importance of the value chain. And I hope that we can have this kind of discussion format na focus on particular problems, Al. Ito food, uh, 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 well, uh, hunger reduction. Okay, and you and know, I'll show Rod uh, the uh, 
the transcript or the recording of this uh, meeting, and then we can have a variation of this uh, in NASC. And we could invite Helen Yap and uh, your team, Frost, to talk about research on the social aspect that's been uh, voiced out by Mercy, Father Ben, and Glenn. But in the case of Helen and Frost, may publication. So talagang ano, it is a scientific study of the social problem. Okay? Critical data regarding how many percentage of people doing, you know, gambling, sabo, and all that. No? So it's it's uh, well documented, also including uh -oh. interviews. Uh, uh -oh. in this. So yeah. and in the post kulang kulang pa yung sinabi mo, pros. May isa pang sakit, womanizing. Ayan. Uh -oh. The number one problem of the nanas, their men are just womanizers. Yeah, so so that's where uh, Father Ben will come in. <laughs> no, but that's really true. We invest a lot also in value formation. Uh, in fact, next week, we are uh, giving them a gender module. The so farmers, we're giving them a gender module, which I got from the SWD. Well, uh, Kasi grabe, masyadong macho na mercy. napaka macho. Advocacy, advocacy rin, siyempre yan ang Zonta. Marami rin tayo materials and speakers for that. Meron nga UN Day na sinaselebrate ang, ang Zonta, gender issues. Yan nga yung uh, um, subject, may speaker tayo dyan. And I blame the mothers, I blame the mothers who are not growing our boys properly. Ayan. We're spoiling them. <laughs> it's so true. It's cultural. <laughs> it's so cultural. Okay. And it's it's showing among the farmers. Mama's boys, talaga mama's boys. I mean, training on that then. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You so Sorry, much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. I learned right. so much today. I learned so much today as well. Yeah, I'm always humbled by uh, the knowledge that I get from uh, all of these chats that we have. And uh, as I always say, we become personal professional and academic friends and collaborators, okay? So thank you all. And uh, we'll have more of this as, as long as we can sustain it. Next week, it's about four women presidents and what they're doing, uh, you know, in their universities, including TIP, UE, Central uh, Escolar University, and Our Lady of Fatima University, if you're interested. Thank you so much, Yas. Now you're showing yourself. So great, Gladys, fantastic uh, presentations you did. And thank you so much to my co-host, uh, the lead researcher, and then to you, Mercy, and all our um, participants and the friends. Thank you so much. Good day, everyone. Thank you all.